current class, we're going to do a screen recording of the slideshow that I would have given you um, for this project to color. So hopefully it works out well. Um, it's kind of new for me to do it this way, but we're figuring it all out together as we go because this is totally unexpected. I hope you guys are all taking care of yourselves and working away on things and you need to start looking at some of the different um, videos and things I've been posting and student examples. I also have this slideshow in the module on color. So this project is going to be using two elements, color and texture. You're not going to forget about all the things you've been learning about the way in which uh, design is balanced and how you can bring emphasis or focal points and the way your eye moves, but you're going to be using these specific elements to make your project. So let's talk a little bit about color. Color has an exact definition. This is the definition from the dictionary. Um, but I'm not going to read it to you. You can read it real quick if you want. But we want to get into it a bit more and kind of unpack some of these things like the quality of the object and then some of these terms like hue, saturation, and brightness. So let's first talk about light. The color of objects we see is due to the way that they're lit in some way or other. They change depending on the lighting. Now light is a really interesting thing. It could be studied in physics. But basically the color that we see is the one that's reflected back in every other color absorbed into it. Light itself actually has color when you refract it in a crystal or water. It's pretty interesting. So if you're really into it, I mean, you can get into the details of physics and get all into it. But it, I really um, don't want to go there with you as much as to just say that this is in some way related to a scientific type of study, the way our eyes perceive things and all the details of the cones and rods in our eyes and what we see back reflected back to us. Now in the world of color there's a visible color or light which is billions. Then there's color film which is can hold quite a lot of color in it but not as much as the visible. And then offset printing is like what they put in these printers and then a color monitor is even smaller than, a little larger than offset printing, but quite a bit smaller than color film. So they all have their limitations, that's the point. And in a way, in this project, you have your limitations because you're going to be mixing pigments and paint, and in a way you're kind of mixing light, but because the pigments, pigments are a certain way, they have their limitations as pigments. And so you're going to have to play with them and use them and use the paint in that way. And now different objects absorb different amounts of light and but part of the spectrum so it's part of how we see texture too because we see shadows on the objects and the way that they reflect and bounce light back at our eyes which we're going to talk more about how you're going to be creating actual texture on some sheets to use with color just some terms hue is the color from a hue like a family in a basic hue of blue or red or orange. So just want you to understand if I say hue, that's what we're talking about. And then a bit more theory. Primary colors, yellow, red, blue. They're primary because they can't be mixed. The secondary colors are mixing uh, two primaries to create one secondary color. So orange, as you know, is yellow and red. Purple is blue and red. And green is yellow and blue. So they're, they're made by mixing two primaries. You know that, I'm sure. But tertiary or intermediate colors is another step that we talk about sometimes, and people don't always know this term, but what it is is a primary, co uh, primary color and then mixed with a secondary color. So green is a secondary color of blue and yellow. If you mix green with more yellow, the color that's in it, one of the colors in green is yellow, then you get an intermediate or tertiary color, yellow, green. Same of all the rest of these. So it's mixing more of one of the primaries or one of the colors that's in, in the color already to create an in-between color. So that would be the term tertiary or intermediate. Now we also like to talk about colors in the way of cool colors 
in warm colors. Now it's fairly easy to understand the idea that you know colors like fire, orange, yellow, red, those are feeling very warm, and then colors that are like water feel cool. But there's a few that are kind of in between, and we're wondering, okay, what are they? Well, purple is considered a cool color. Green is a cool color. But within the spectrum of each of the colors, like green, for example, there's cooler versions of green, ones that have more blue and ones that are warmer that have more yellow. Okay? And when you mix, uh, when you're using the colors and mixing them, you're going to want to pay attention to the paint that you bought. If it's on the warmer yellow side, for example, or a cooler yellow side, that would mean it would have an undertone of something like green in it, and it would kind of mess up. If you're trying to get a really bright color, it may mess up with whatever color you're mixing with. So if you had like a cooler green with, cooler yellow, I should say, with green in it, and you were trying to get a really bright or uh, bright orange, and you had a cooler red that's more like a violet, so yellow and red make orange, you would end up with something that's not as bright. It would be a duller because it has a cooler undertone. Or, potentially, because the green and the red are opposites and so they'll mess each other up. So you have to find, um, pay attention to what the paint's doing when you're mixing it. I'm sure you might be a little bit confused by that. We'll hopefully try to unpack it a little bit as we go. In essence, so we want to say warm colors, red, yellow, orange, cool colors, green, blue, and purple is considered a cool color because it has blue in it. That one's the one that people don't always can't easily figure out. Now we also want to think about colors as being active. They're moving forward, passive. They're just sitting there a little bit in neutral, that they're not necessarily um, achromatic because they're not gray and black and white, but they're not um, full of a lot of chroma. They're in the tans and things. If you design something with warm or saturated colors on it, then the muted colors will become the passive colors. If you giant design something with all neutral colors, and then even a muted color would all of a sudden become very active. So it's really about what's around it. In general, though, we think of active ranges as being the really bright, warm colors are the most active, passive being the cooler colors, and then neutrals besides gray, we're talking about browns, um, tans and, and things like that, and black and white are neutral as well. Now, when, I, when I'm having you in the project sheet, you'll see that you're supposed to create a, um, a color swatch that's similar to the one you did for the value scale. You can do a color scale. I want you to think about the fact that color and value relate to each other because this will help you think about how you organize them. If something has um, an extra amount of black in it, then it becomes a really darker value even though it's still purple. Or if white, it becomes a lighter value even though it has a purple color to it, for example, in this. Another thing we'll talk about is a tint is your hue plus white. And then the tone is your hue plus gray. And the shade is your hue plus black. So when you do your scale with the colors, you're going to need to be adding white and black to them to get it. All colors have a value to them, whether they're achromatic or have chroma in them, they still have value, and that's the real point that I'm trying to make. And when we try to draw in black and white medium, we end up kind of having problems because we say, oh, what if you're drawing a black object and you want to put shade on it, how do you do it? Well, that's part of the kind of difficulty of black and white mediums. And again, just to show you again, kind of that yellow is the lightest value color in the spectrum, and like a blue or purple, really dark blues and purples, ends up being the darkest ones. So when you're playing with your um, composition, you're going to want to think about it though, like the value pattern, it'll have a color pattern. So how much, if you use the color straight out of the tube, or you added black to them, or white to them, it's going to affect the value pattern on the piece which is connected to the color pattern. Just getting, kind of connecting the theory together in your mind with this here. So when you go to make your 10 step, you're going to have your pure color and then you're going to add successive amounts of black to it. You're going to add successive amounts of white to it to have the steps. 
just like you did with the value one with the white and black you're going to quickly realize that if you add uh, it takes just a dab of red in this example with white to make a really light pink and to really ch and same with and then on the black side it won't take very much black to the red to get pretty dark quickly so you're gonna have to play with being careful with having a pretty color and adding just a little bit of black at a time and just having the white and adding just a little bit of red at a time to figure out how to get the switches to happen it's going to take a while but it's a really important part of understanding how to mix the paint and understand the colors uh, quickly back here a lot of people get confused on the project sheet you only have to do this for one color and I would recommend it being one of the primary colors that you buy straight out of the tube so red yellow or blue and pick the one that you'll be using the most in your design because it will be the most helpful to you you do not have to do this for all primary colors just one this is kind of showing you how this connects to the idea of monochromatic one color plus black and white. That would be, you could make an entire composition with black, white, and one color and it would be called monochromatic. This color formula offers 16 levels of the same hue. Do you see that? So this is all green in hue, but it's having tints, shades, and then the original tone or hue right there. Okay? As an example, if you did this in a painting, well, there's a few things that aren't quite as part of the hue. What would they be? The yellow, but yellows and green. But the main thing is if you see this tiny sliver of red, it pops way out at you because red is the opposite on the color wheel from green, and the rest of it's almost monochromatic. So it's a way of creating a focal point in a piece and having, you know, a big impact on something. This introduces the idea of complementary colors. That's colors that are opposite of each other on the color wheel. Well, you say, how do they complement each other? They complement each other by making each other pop out. So that's kind of how you can remember. You have blue and orange. So Denver's Broncos colors or lots of sports teams use this. Red and green. Christmas colors, yes. Yellow and purple. I guess you could say Los Angeles Lakers colors and other sports teams that use these opposites, but they make each other pop out. Another thing that's important about this is that when you mix them, opposite colors on the op on the wheel, this is true of not just the um, primaries, but any color has this opposite on the wheel. Even the intermediates, even the uh, secondary colors, you'll see that the opposite of uh, one of the primaries is usually a mix of the two second the two other primaries so that it splits but anyway that's getting into too much detail if you mix them together you'll get a lot of neutrals and they turn either gray or kind of brown in nature and this is very important because when you're doing your compositions if you want something to be neutral but to still feel like it belongs in the painting you, if you mix your neutral colors with the colors in it, like if you made this whole thing mostly of blue and orange, when you mix these neutral colors in it, in this painting, they mix them, then it actually feels like it belongs, it has harmony in the color palette. Complementary colors are, this is using a lot of them in Wayne Tebow, are also a great way to add subtle um, points of interest and make things stand out so we have orange throughout this piece like a it's a rhythm and repetition throughout the piece you could say moving throughout and he has blue in the shadows these shadows are very very blue you can see it here and it really makes the feeling of the hills stand out this is obviously san francisco and he has he's playing with the idea of really steep hill but because the red this would be usually red right curb that you're not supposed to park on but he's made it orange and it makes the blues and the oranges really pop throughout. You see on the roof and throughout the whole piece, there's like a mixed contrast. There's white blues, dark, darker blues, different types of mixed blues throughout it. So it's a way of creating interest, visual interest and also um, showing contrast and making neutrals. Here, this is a piece by Gauguin. Um, uh, and you have the idea of the red and the greens being like a way to create Tahiti. So he went down to Tahiti and painted a lot in his style. And you can see he's making a lot of these neutrals throughout here. 
of actually mixing red and green together, getting and adding yellow 